Excellent. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth session of our six-month biocontrol technical workshop series of the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. My name is Alison, and I will be your moderator for today's session. And I'm joined by uh, Dr. Roma Gwyn, who will be our resident expert today on biopesticides. And Roma will take us through some of the issues that arise in biopesticide trials. Dr. Rika Joy Floor from ERI will be joining us at the end to give us a brief summary. So it's an all woman line up today uh, as we get ready for International Women's Day next Monday. So, so it's great to see. So thank you, Roma, and thank you, um, thank you, Rika, for, for your summary later on. Turning to the next page. Before we start, I just want to run quickly through how to use the Zoom platform today. The key message that we have is that we really want to hear your questions. We'll make plenty of time to answer those. And please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if you want to share any research links, publications, make general comments, uh, share the work that you're doing, please make these in the chat box. Uh, if you can ensure that your name is correct so that we know who you are, um, you can rename it in the box by using more, uh, clicking on the more box and renaming yourself there. Uh, and if you have any technical issues with the Zoom platform, uh, please feel free to chat to us in the chat box and Pranav, our uh, resident technical expert on Zoom, will be on standby to help you out. Okay, on the next page, I'm just going to give a little bit of plug for the reminder that this is the fourth session of a six month series. We're halfway through. This series is hosted by Grow Asia under the ASEAN Action Plan. It's supported by experts and organizations from across the region and the world. And participation is open to everyone. Uh, and we really want to hear from you. So I'll be inviting all the registered participants from today's session and the last sessions uh, to an online forum discussion on our new knowledge and innovation hub to be launched in the next 10 days. So expect an uh, email from me with this presentation today uh, and the recording. Moving on, I just want to remind you that today's session, as I just said, was part of a series and you will see here that we're up to uh, session number four. Next uh, session in about two weeks will be around farmer acceptance of biocontrol approaches and scale up issues. And we have some wonderful speakers already lined up for that. And then this will be followed by the return of Roma, which sort of sounds like a movie title <laughs> from Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> for our second biopesticide bio session. Um, I'll also be giving um, certificates of participation after the session to those of you who have uh, attended the last four sessions. Um, and I know I get lots of questions about that, so I will be reaching out to you. Now, if we move to the next slide, it's our chance today to really find out uh, more on biopesticide trials with an international expert. Um, I've already seen the presentation and I can tell you truthfully, it's packed full of useful information. It has polls, question time, lots of tips for your work to apply to your own trials. We'll formally finish the session uh, in sort of a one hour 30 sort of time period. But if any of you want to wish, uh, if any of you wish to stay on afterwards uh, to ask further the questions we're going to just stay online and very informally have a chat so if you've got some questions we'll stay for another 15 minutes um, so if you're interested please stay uh, we have two polls throughout our tech throughout our presentation on technical type questions and I've actually made these polls anonymous so please give them a go don't feel shy that we're going to record what your answers are because we're not um, but it will provide the group with lots of good discussion so please answer them and the last time I looked, we had had over 400 people register for this session. So that's absolutely fantastic. And I'm hoping for lots of discussion. So if we move on to the next slide. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Roma Gwynn. Uh, she is a biopesticide specialist working in the field for some 30 years. She has taken a lead role internationally in the development and registra registration of new biopesticide technologies, including semi-chemical, botanical and microbial substances. Her expertise is in facilitating the process of getting biopesticide products 
onto the market with a particular exp expertise and efficacy. I'd also say her expertise is really being able to communicate in a very simple, uh, easy to understand way uh, to people as well. So I'm really looking forward to today's session. And Roma actually led our introductory session uh, on biopesticides in October last year. So it's a real pleasure to have her coming back and joining us today. So Roma, it's, it's over to you and uh, good luck, no pressure. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, Alison, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, um, to, to do this today. And thank you for your very kind words um, to me. I'm, I'm hoping the audience will find this, um, this a really useful session. And it comes about um, through the work that I've been doing throughout my career on doing tr uh, trial work, initially doing trials for agrochemicals and then moving into doing trials for for biopesticides. And what I know is when I'm working with biopesticides, but much less of my trials work. And there was a point at which I got very frustrated with this. And I thought, I need to understand why my trials aren't working and what's happening. So there's a point where I might, um, I was doing sort of two or 300 trials a year with a range of technologies. And whilst a lot of that work was confidential, it allowed me at the same time to see a lot of that data and to sort of look into that data and say, what's this data telling us about biopesticides? And so the presentation and the discussion workshop we're doing today is sort of much me sharing with you what I think I saw in all of that data. Um, and I hope you take up um, Alison's invite and to put questions into the or pose questions to us or share your experiences. Um, because I think if we sh all share our experiences, we can really help to move um, the biopesticides forward and to come up with good trial designs so that we, we, we're perhaps all a little less frustrating. So what I'll do today is I'll talk a little bit about the context, um, just so that we understand what technologies we're talking about. Then I'm going to sort of ask the question is what is efficacy and then sort of saying looking across the trial data I've seen what does the data usually look what look like what are we actually seeing. So if I look first at context um, so just what we should remember is that um, for food security we despite all the good technologies we have we're still losing crops before harvest and after harvest so it means we haven't got it perfect yet. So how do we meet this challenge well we need best practice. And I think what we can all see is that increasingly biological technologies, biopesticides are part of the mainstay of, of crop protection. And we see this, this um, their role in crop protection through integrated pest management. And what this means in, in simple terms is we first think about the, our agronomic practices, you know, what's the field, what's the variety I'm growing, um, what's my underlying field agronomy. I look out for my pests and diseases, I watch as much as possible looking at decision um, da damage thresholds, decision thresholds, then I'll try and perhaps physical interventions where you may cover a crop with fleece to protect it. If that doesn't work then you come in with biological interventions and then at the last moment it, it's got completely out of kilter you'll look at chemical intervention. That's a very simplified approach to IPM and of course there is a level of, of, of greater integration than that. So if I'm talking about biopesticides, what, what do I mean? So we're talking about, they are sometimes called bioprotectants, biological technologies, biocontrol solutions. And we're broadly talking about four types of technologies. We're talking macroorganisms. So these are the predators, parasitoids, beneficial insects. We're talking about microorganisms, and these could be microorganisms, which would be bacteria, fungi, and viruses against uh, plant pathogens, against um, insects and very rarely against um, weeds as well. Then we've got a group called botanicals or plant extracts or natural substances. And these are, these are substances that um, you'll find in nature. They're not um, conventional um, chemicals. They're not synthesized chemicals. And then the next group we have is semiochemicals. And these are substances which are usually produced by one organism to affect the behavior of another organism. And our best examples are perhaps mating disruption substances. But you may be familiar with semiochemicals where you're using them as part of your monitoring and for trapping and monitoring your pest populations. Something that you really need to take note of and because this affects the trials is that these bioprotectants all have multiple modes of action against the target um, and they also have, can induce interactions with the plants and some of this is the root of why 
we have perhaps some difficulty in doing trials with biopesticides. And another problem we have is, is you know, we, when we grow food, we're growing food um, as a monoculture. And what we know um, as biologists and ecologists is that compared to nature, a cropping system is much less stable, which is why we get these outbreaks of insects and diseases. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is have an intervention and a management to stop this pest or disease becoming dominant. Um, and we can do that with biological solutions and they can be used um, by conservation. So we look after the natural enemies. We have flower margins. We, we, we use um, chemicals that aren't causing harm to the to natural enemies. There's also um, ways in which you can actually in, deliberately introduce something that's classical biocontrol. But what we mainly do in agriculture and horticulture is what's known as augmentation. And in its, in its simplest term, we, we have a pest we have our biocontrol agent, we throw one against the other and hopefully we have dead pests is, is one of the ideas. So it's, it's a really sim simple idea. So this is augmented control and it's an inundative release. When we're dealing with biopesticides, their biology and ecology really has a strong role to play in how we, how we can um, get them to work well. And just if we think about some of the microbial um, bioinsecticides, if we look here at, um, say, bacillus and, and virus, bacillus thuringiensis and viruses, what they do is they have to be eaten by the insect to have their effect. Whereas if we look at Bovaria, Metarismi, Zara, they attach to the cuticle of the insect um, and then burrow in. So what this means um, when we're thinking about a trial is we need to understand the mode of action so we can understand how we need to place the biopesticide onto the crop so that we get the best intercept between our target and the, bio, the biocontrol agent. So for example, if the insect needs to eat it, the insect's moving. So where we place it in the crop, we need to think where the insect is, where it's moving and which parts the plant it's feeding on. And we need to make sure that those are the parts that get the biopesticide application. And if you think about Bavaria metrism, where we, we need it to come in contact with the cuticle, again, we need to think where that insect is. Um, is it hiding? How do we get our spray application to the insect? And something you'll hear me say again through this presentation, the thing about biopesticides is actually it betrays us if we're bad at applying them because they're not persistent, because they're not highly toxic. If you don't place, if they're not placed in the right place at the right time for the insect's life cycle, you reduce your efficacy. So we have to, application becomes a very important part of what we're doing. And, and hopefully you, you realize that it's really important to understand the biology of the plant and the biology of the target. And then I also mentioned um, it, it, when we're thinking about the mode of action is that a lot of these products, they don't just um, have a direct effect on the pest or disease, but they also have this interaction with the plant. So if we think about something like trichoderma, now, okay, okay, you may think, oh, we don't use trichoderma for fall armorworm, but perhaps we do. So what this picture shows is, is at the front here are the untreated plants and here are the treated plants. Um, and when you look at both those, they didn't have disease on either of those, but what we could see is the trichoderma treated plant where the seed was treated, it allowed the plants to um, withstand environmental stress because there's a sustained period of drought just after planting. So I put this up to sort of say, well, what's happening with a lot of these um, biopesticides is they have these multiple interactions. And again, this makes our trials complicated, but it's also the benefit of the technology. And what we're trying to do is say, well, this is much more complicated to do trials, but we want these benefits and we want net benefits. And I said, you know, you think of trichoderma as something to treat diseases, but there's some lovely work that's come out in Brazil, which has shown that if they put trichoderma on the seeds of maize, what the maize then does is sends out a signal to the parasitoid to come and kill the fall armyworm. So again, we need to sort of understand all the possibilities of these technologies and how to get the best out of them. So that was really what I was gonna say is terms of background so that we all sort of understand the context of the technologies that we're working with. 
I just wanted to pause for a moment and um, sort of see if, if anybody at this stage had any questions and wanted some clarifications about the types of technologies I'm talking about. Excellent, thanks Roma. Um, I do have a question here that's come through um, with, it was something that you mentioned before and just, just mentioned around biopesticides having these multiple interactions and potential benefits. Um, and you gave that lovely seed example. Is there, uh, is there a place where we can um, find more uh, information around these sorts of types of uh, other benefits? Because I, I think that's of real interest to, to the group. Yeah, I, do, I don't think there's a, there's a single source. I think this is where we have to have the shared knowledge between us um, and to understand what we're looking at. So, you know, what one example I can think of is that if you apply a microorganism to a plant, um, uh, I'm being anthropomorphic here, but when you at the moment you apply that to the plant, the plant doesn't think, is this a pathogen or is this something that doesn't matter to me? The plant's reaction is to switch on its defense mechanisms. So instantly you've switched on the plant's defense mechanisms. So if you want to sort of understand and find more information about that, there is some really good um, work done uh, and widely published um, about how plants react um, to the, to stimulus, um, put substances sprayed onto the plant, whether it's a botanical or whether it's a microorganism. So I think this, there is a slight difficulty and there isn't one place where you can find this information. It's, it, it's an assimilation of all the information. It's having workshops like this where we share our experiences together, um, where you can start to find this, this information. And it's, this is my sort of call to say, when you're doing trials, be really good observers. Remember, you know, you're a scientist and, really see what's going on. Because another thing that I can, I've seen with botanicals, and this makes trials very complicated, is a botanical, if you we think about what botanicals do in the plant, they're often the plant for plant defense mechanisms. Um, so you, no surprises, when we spray them back out there, it switches on plant defense mechanisms. Now complicating factor in trials, and what I've seen, is it switches on the plant mechanisms, not just in my treated plot, but it signals to my untreated plots and you get plant defense mechanisms switched on there, which makes trials a little tricksy. Okay. So Alison, answering your question, there isn't one single source. It has to come from a simulation of shared knowledge between us. Excellent. Well, I, I like that message anyway, and that, that fits in with our series. We've got lots of questions coming in, so I'm just going to ask a few. We'll have to be quick. Um, and this sort of relates to what you've been saying, actually. So it was, does trichoderma have a positive effect on the efficacy of biopesticides? And what is the mechanism of protection by trichoderma? That is an enormous research question. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly, maybe we can just give a bit of a... Yes, so, so trichoderma has multiple interactions, um, but what it seems to do is it, it seems to have some way of interacting with the plant, which strengthens the plant's defense mechanisms against pests and diseases. Okay. It's the simplest way to put it. <laughs> and we can follow up. I, I know who's asked that question. Another quick question. I'd like to ask you about SF MP, MPV. I want to use it in my field, but I don't know how to buy it. Where can I find it? Yeah, now this comes to, to the availability of products. Um, so this would having to, to reach out to the company um, if you and find out where they've got registrations. So this is the registration. You have to go to your local authority, find out what's approved. Um, if it's not approved, reach out to the company and say, look, I think there's a market here. Um, I think this is useful um, and work with the company to get regulatory approval. Okay, excellent. Um, we're going to move forward, but I've got 11 open questions at the moment. So what I suggest is we move forward because we've got a lot of good stuff to come and we will have lots of time throughout the uh, session. So I'll let you go forward uh, there, Roma, and don't worry, everyone, we'll come back to the questions. There's, there's lots of time, so we will address them. Yeah, and as you say, Alison, we've got that half an hour at the end, so if anybody's still got burning questions, we, we, we can um, pick, up, pick up on it there as well. So hopefully what I've given you is, is a context. Um, and what I'm gonna look at now is what is efficacy? So this is where we, we're gonna ask you for some ideas. Um, so we've got a little poll that's coming up and I'd like to ask the question, um, do biopesticides work? Now I've, I've asked this question before 
I've asked this to a range of different audiences. I've asked this to students, I've asked this to growers, uh, farmers, I've asked this to scientists. So I'd be really interested today to see what your response is in. Could we launch the poll, please? We'll just give you some time to answer it. Just remember there's three questions there. So if you can just scroll down, you'll see the third question as well, if you haven't already seen it. And, and just, I wanna remind you, we're, we're not taking your name down. So just have a go and have a think about what you think is the best answer. Uh, it's not a- it's... I, I, I just had a go as well. I <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So I'll share with you when you finished what, what students say and what farmers say, um, what regulators say. And Pranav, can you see how many um, people have answered the poll? We're at 65%, Alison. Oh, that's pretty good. So should we try and, if everyone can try it, some people can't submit. Oh, I can't see the poll. Two yeah, people. that sometimes happens if your yep. computer the graphics aren't so good. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. So you could note your answers and then compare it. So here we go. Here's, here's the sharing the results. Okay. Okay, so that's that's quite interesting. So 41% of you think it needs to be above 75% or well, actually, if I count together 75% and the above 75, that's 61% of you think that. Uh, very nice, 29% think 50%. And what do farmers think is acceptable? Okay. Again, is, is, you feel that the farmers think in a similar way to the scientists and what do the regulators think? Yes, yeah, so and more you think the pressure is the regulators who push to have a higher level of, of control. That, that, that's really quite interesting, thank you for that. So this brings up sort of, us, I'm trying to stimulate us to think about um, what efficacy is and what we what, what what it looks like and what I know from doing this work with farmers is actually um, sorry my, uh, my screen's frozen uh, let's see if I can yeah there we go so what we know is that farmers actually want consistency so in the, all the work I've done the farmers say they don't mind if it's 50 percent efficacy as long as they know it's 50% efficacy and it's reliably 50% efficacy because they can then manage and work with it knowing that. So for them, it's, it's a lower level of efficacy than we think it is. And just to share with you, when I ask this to students, students usually say 80% and above and some of them even just say, you need 100%. Um, I suspect it's because students haven't worked in the fields so much and perhaps don't know what it actually the reality is. So when we talk about efficacy, um, what, 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 what does it mean? What, when we say, does a biopesticide work? What does this mean? And it's sort of saying, you know, what is efficacy? What do we mean by that term? And it, I'm not gonna necessarily answer that. I'm posing that to you as a question is to understand what you mean by efficacy. And maybe at the end of this um, session, you've got some ideas about that. You know, the other part we need to know is not just it's absolutely efficacy as a standalone, but how can I use it within an IPM program? Does it do anything to the other products that I want to use? Does it do anything to turn natural enemies? How, how's this product working within an IPM program? How, what's this interaction with, with, with chemical pesticides that I'm using? Because sometimes you potentially ha could have synergy as well as a detrimental effect. What, what is that? So when I'm asking the question, does it work? I'm actually asking all of these things. What are the effects I expect to see? Um, another disadvantage is what, what are the advantages? So when we ask that very simple question, we're actually bringing together all of these, um, these concepts um, and we're, we're, we're trying to understand what it is. So if you understand what you're asking, then you can design your trials well because you're asking, 
you design your trail to answer the question you're actually asking. So when we say, does this work? We have to take that apart and understand what it is I'm trying to ask. So um, another little bit of work for you all. Um, what I'd like to understand and as part of the sort of shared workshop and shared experience that we've got here today is to understand what, what's your experience with biopesticide trials? Um, what have you done before? Um, and and how, how much have you worked them? So there's another poll being launched here. I'll just, I'll just add in here for question one, actually. I, I forgot to put a have not run trials. So if you, I'm going to skew the results slightly here, I think. Uh, Roma? Yeah, okay. So yeah. if people could choose maybe microorganisms if for, for, or do, for nothing, then you'll be able to submit the, submit the survey. Okay. For question number one. Yeah, and you'll be able to see when well, the answer the last one is naught. Yeah. But that's, um, yeah. So I'll go to the naught, that, that result first. Yep. Okay, we're at 50%. Okay, keep going. I think the more you can take part in the poll, the more you can share, I think um, it helps us all understand what we're all trying to do. Your words of encouragement seem to have worked, Roma. We're at 57%. <laughs> And also just a reminder, um, you can just choose microorganisms for your first choice, uh, even if you haven't run trials. I, I, it's my fault, I forgot to put a, put a not applicable answer there. Yeah, I think my fault also, Alison, so that's both, yeah. Okay, we're at 62%, are you happy to close? Give people a couple of seconds, because sometimes it's just to make the technology work. Any change? 65. Okay, I think probably that's good. Okay, oh, so let me just, microorganisms high, but that could be what Alison you're saying is the naught. So yeah, so we think 31% of people said no, they haven't done trials. So we can take 30% of the microorganisms off. So what it seems is, there's a fairly more work has been done with botanicals and microorganisms and slightly less with semi chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, most of the work um, is with in insects. Um, and what we seem to have got in the audience is a cross section of people who've been working at universities, research station, but also with farmers. And I think that is really quite, quite interesting. Um, and if we look at the number of um, trials people have done, most people have done one to five trials. And I think what this says to me is that I'm guessing those people who've done one to five trials are in the really frustrated category, um, because with one to five trials, you, it's really hard to see your data. I think I said, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm doing sort of two or 300 trials a year. So it's much easier to see what's going on in your, in your data when you've only got one to five trials. I think it, that makes life very difficult. But what it tells me is the audience has got a lot of experience of doing trials, which is really great. And hopefully you'll learn something today. Thank you all. So Alison, did we have any um, questions related to this that we want to pick up on? We have a lot of questions. So I'm just, maybe we can just ask a few. I'll go down to the end. Um... I mean, this, this is happening, this is a common question that we have that day by day, the spray cost is going on, uh, is higher in terms of labor and cost. Farmers mm -hmm. need reliable, consistent solutions and they don't wish to have less than 100% control, which is impossible. So I guess that's a comment and it gets back to what you were asking, what farmers were happy to to mm -hmm. use. What, what's your... What's your yeah, thing? I think I think that I think that is... Some, that, that, that's about an education process. And I think if you, 
when I speak, first speak to farmers, they say that we don't want any pests and diseases. But when you start to explore that question, so I was doing some work in Benin um, a, a few years ago and with some organic cotton farmers. Um, and we had a farmer meeting and we, we asked this, that, that, I asked that question to him, sort of saying, what level of effect do you want? And they all said, oh, we just don't want any pests. But then if you start to explore and explore that conversation, they all sort of said, well, actually that's not kind of true. Um, because what I also do is this, and what I also do is this. And in fact, as long as I can just keep them below this level at this particular time, then I can manage that. And it turns out that they, they all sort of, when they looked through what they wanted, they only wanted 50% effect. So I think we need to be thoughtful about that message back from farmers and have a really close discussion with farmers about when something works, what does it mean? Because what the farmer wants, he, he wants a good quality, healthy crop, economically grown. Um, he doesn't actually want to kill all the insects there. So I think it's, I'd invite whoever asked that question to go back and really talk to growers in detail about what, what it is they, they, they want and what they usually say is they want the crop to be clean, but they don't need to kill all the pests and diseases. Yeah, very good. Uh, here's another question here. I'm working on botanicals on fall armyworm, and you mentioned that botanicals doesn't help the plant mechanism. Um, many literatures show that some botanicals had little residues on the crop. My question is, what botanicals are not advisable to control fall armyworm? Okay, so first of all, sort of what I did say is that bot botanicals do interact with the plant. Yeah. Uh, so just to be clear on that one. Yep. So absolutely. And then, um, so as in the second part was? Uh, actually, you know, I've just, I've just oh, moved it. <laughs> no, okay, that's sorry. Okay. Yes. No, oh, um, that's right. The second part was around which botanicals are good to be using with fall armyworm. I think the, we're, we're at the experimental stage of that. We don't know the answer to that yet. I think there are some indications um, we can look at other a look at products that are working against other lepidopterans. Um, and I think that would give us some clues as to what, what we should think about testing. But I think we're at the stage where we that needs to be tested um, and um, to see, see what, what, it, what is our most effective. Yeah. And then the third part, sorry, I'm a bit slow. No, that's okay. I've got another question actually for you though around BT um, and yep. the, the application of that. And this is quite a specific question. It's just around how do you know when the best timing for application is on sweet maize. So it's a very specific question, but maybe a more generic answer around um, the importance of application and, and timing would be yeah. useful. So yeah, to, to, to find the right timing, it's you have to understand your insect pest. So what we know for a lot of the microorganisms is they work better when you're working with the younger larval stages, you get better efficacy. So what you'd be doing is looking at the population you have in the field, how synchronous it is, um, and looking at when you've got those young larvae um, and coinciding your application to, um, to manage the young larval population. So that, that, the answer to that question is you have to understand there isn't a prescriptive answer. You have to understand your field. You have to understand when the insects come in. You have to understand what your population is doing. So this is the primary part of IPM, which is yep. about that observation and forecasting. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's an excellent answer. It really is part of that IPM um, and really understanding what's happening in your crop. So thank you. And I've got another uh, comment or question here. And it, it went back to around the leaf damage and then the yield uh, mm -hmm. and the data. And are there other parameters we can collect to observe, for example, those other types of interactions or plant health measures? Yes. And if you hang around to, to the end of this, this presentation, you'll find out what they are. So. <laughs> Well, that's 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 a great <laughs> that's actually a great link, Roma. Thank you. Into the next section, so maybe we'll start yeah. uh, and move on, and we'll keep collecting all those questions. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so one of the things that that poll showed us is there's quite a lot of um, people listening to this webinar who have done trials in the laboratory, and the general way that when we've got new technology or we want to start to understand. Um, using the technology against new pests is we start in the laboratory. Then we, we, we move into a pot and then we move into the field. But what we also know is that laboratory efficacy does not equal field efficacy and nor does it equal some commercial success. So we seen, we all know, and yet we still are guilty of doing it, is we do laboratory pot work and field work and we expect 
that the product will work the same in the others. It doesn't. Now, my ideas on this is, is we, we, don't, we stop doing the laboratory work. So all a laboratory study will tell you is, does something work or not? It won't tell you the rates. It won't tell you when to work. It'll, and it may tell you the, the life stage for an insect, but it really only tells you very little information. It tends to tell you when something doesn't work rather than when something does work. So what I favour when I'm working with biopesticides, because you have these multiple modes of interaction and you're wanting to capture all those modes of interaction when you do a an assay, is that you start with pots or what I'd call mini plot work, because this allows you to make sure that you capture all the different modes of action that these technologies have in terms of an assessing it. And it leads back to the question that was just asked, is what are all the things that you need to assess? Um, then from mini plots you can move into the field and, and mini plots can also be quite useful um, with so for example when you're trying to work with big crops like an avocado you can't work with a whole big tree but what you can do is perhaps work with a small tree in a nursery and you sort of miniaturize it down but you have to think very carefully about how to do that and how to have the experimental design and that sort of part two of this session is, is really going into the detail of that but I think just remember that don't over rely on laboratory work because laboratory work really can only tell you when something doesn't work at all it does you can't find rates from that you can't find um, much else from that so I encourage people to try and work with the plants when they're trying to test these technologies so when we're thinking what's available commercially um, I am you know what do regulators approve so this is an example of some uh, products that are approved in Europe um, and the mixture of microorganisms and botanicals um, and other substances. And when you say the regulators only need 80%, actually that's not true. If we look here, quite a few of these products don't hit the 80%, but they're still getting regulatory approval. And how does this happen? Well, this is within regulation. It doesn't actually say that you need 80% of efficacy above. To have the word control on the label, sometimes you do, but actually regulators don't require that. What they do, what happens is you submit your data set and based on that data set, then you write a label that matches the, the data set. So if you're only getting 50% efficacy, the label may be sort of saying, you know, used as part of an IPM program, this will help you to manage the insect pest or disease. And so you need to sort of, again, understand what level of efficacy how that's reflected on the label, then if you're picking up that product, how to read the label well and how to use it, what's it telling you about. So then something else that none of us know is the dose response curve for biopesticides. I have never found good data on a dose response curve. So the question I would ask you is when you were starting to work with the technology is what is the dose response curve for your substance. So if we look here at this grey line, the, many chemicals, conventional synthesized pesticides, um, will follow a sigmoidal dose response curve. But which of these might represent the biopesticide I'm working with? Now this pale turquoise line is representative of a semiochemical chemical because a semiochemical chemical works with a threshold. When you put semiochemical chemical in, in, unless you hit the critical point at which you get the insect's response, you don't have a response. Then you get pretty much all of your response. As you increase dose, th that tends to increase persistence, but it doesn't increase efficacy. So we need to understand that. And then if we think of a microorganism, which may be affected by environmental conditions, what you might see is that you, you've got some effect and then at a certain point, no, despite increasing the dose, you don't see it any more effect and then you get effect again. And this is related to what happens in the environmental conditions, what happens with the insect, um, what's the lifestyle stage of the population when you put that dose in. So one of the things I'd encourage people to do is, is try to understand what that dose response curve might look like. And I know for microorganisms, in all the data I've looked at, I have never seen a consistent dose response curve. So just laying that on the table. I sometimes see that in some trials, but I never see it consistently. Um, so when I have, when I work with people who sort of say, oh no, this is what the dose response curve is here. I've got some really big questions around that because I've never seen that. But I think it's a good way to think about what, you, what you're working with to start to understand 
um, what, the, what the substance does and how it interacts against the pest and what effect you're going to get. <clears throat> So the other complicating factor when we're trying to think about trials and thinking what we're doing is we're using it in an IPM program. Now, in an ideal IPM program, we come in and we should be able to use the product once and it keeps the population below the damage threshold. Um, and this would be where you understand the efficacy that you're going to get. You understand your pest population so you know when to put, put this in. But if you've understand less about it, you often see that the, the, the pest or disease has gone about the damage threshold, you need to come in with something. But what you should remember is we think about needing 100% efficacy, but each application doesn't need to give you 100%. So in this model, we're having 30% effect, we have 20% uh, recovery of the population, and then I go in and I have another 30% effect and 20% recovery. And what we can see is within these three applications, we've got below the damage threshold. And it's really simple. If you have 30% effect three times, you've had 90% effect. That's what IPM is about. That's what we're doing. And that's why farmers don't mind that you don't get 80% first. They, they want, you can use it in a way that overcomes the fact that you don't have 80% efficacy. And it relates to the question that was just asked, but there's a cost to that. And how do you manage that cost in terms of application um, timing and I think that's that's the trickier question that we have to work on saying if you need to apply a product three times how do you make that economic so then sort of su summarizing a little bit sort of what hopefully we've understood from this part of the session is is, is says, what are we trying to achieve when we start to think about a trial think about what we're trying to achieve what's the mode of action what's the dose response curve how's this product going to work in the agro ecosystem how might I want to use it in an IPM program um, what interactions might I see with the, the other uh, plant protection products that have been using? Um, will, the, will the product survive? If it's a microorganism, how long is it going to persist in the crop? So then depending on that might depend on how often you need to reply. Do I need to use an adjuvant? Will an adjuvant help this product? Um, and then need to think about how you deliver the technology into the crop. So I was going to take a pause there, Alison, just to see whether we've got any sort of burning questions that have been raised. Thanks, Roma. And uh, we have lots of burning questions. Okay. <laughs> They're starting to mount. Uh, I have one here from Pierre. Bonjour, Pierre. Uh, what about repellency as a measure of efficacy for botanicals, for example? Yeah, that, yes, absolutely. That is, that's one of the complicating things in a trial. If you think you're going to have repellency, how on earth do you design a trial for doing that? And I do touch on that in the next part of, of, of the session, if, if it's okay to, to postpone that. Yep. Um, and if it's I have answered that question, another teaser. Yeah, please ask it again. Another teaser there, Roma, for the, for the next session. It's very well done. Um, here, here's a question from Cyril. Is the green line in the graph um, preferred to bot botanicals? If it is, what specifically botanicals are you working with? I'm working on botanicals, and I think he he he's interested to know what what this might represent. Uh, which um, yeah, I have seen that for botanicals. Yeah, that's true. Um, I can't tell you what data it is, but I've worked with a, a wide range of botanicals. Um, you know, from uh, which are mainly terpene based is the ones I'm tending to think about. I've done more work with those than I have with say something like neem. Um, and again, I think for each of the botanic, there isn't a generic um, dose response curve for every botanical. You will have a dose response curve that relates to your target and your crop. Um, and that's what you have to understand. It's not necessarily going to be the same for the same product in every, on every occasion. Okay, excellent. Here's another question. How about if the limiting factor is not having, uh, not established in the laboratory, can one still continue to conduct research on biopesticides with just pot and field experiments? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And I, th I think what I would encourage first is to work on that, a well thought out pot mini plot design um, and think about what what's the question I'm asking? What's the, what do I know about my um, product? And what do I know about my crop? And what do I know about my target? And take the assimilation of that knowledge to design a really well-designed trial. Um, and that starts to give you, you can start to do range finding work to find out what sort of dose you might need. So you can do some work to understand what's the right life part of the life cycle that you need to apply the product. And you can perhaps even look at it, say what happens if I co-apply or 
I've got other technologies working in there. So yes, certainly for registration, I only go forward in registering something and getting something approved using mini plots and large scale field trials. I don't use laboratory. Thank you. Good tip there. Thank you, Roma. Uh, here's, a, here's a comment, I guess, and, and it'd be good to have your take on this. Increasing the dose of biopesticides can cause phytotoxicity problems. We've seen this with our products. So what's your experience there? Yeah, actually, I've, I've, I've never seen it with a microorganism at all. Um, and I've rarely seen it with a botanical. But I think that's an important point is you need to know that you need to know what happens. What I've seen with a botanical sometimes is it's concentration specific. So you need to think about your water volumes so that you're not getting it. And it's also sometimes specific to the life stage of the crop um, that you might see some sort of sensitivity at certain stages that you won't see at another stage. But when it's going back to the questions we're asking, if one of the questions I would always ask is, am I seeing any adverse effects on the crop when I use this product? So it's part of the questions you're asking when you run an efficacy trial. Excellent, and that, that sort of feeds into this next question. Um, do biopesticides post a risk to the environment and human health? And at what level can we tell if it's acceptable? Okay, so that, that's that's a regulatory question and that rela relates to um, the evidence you need to present um, for registration. So those are questions that are asked in a registration and you have to address those. Um, so in terms of what something does on the, to the environment, you um, need to present information about what happens to your substance when it's in the natural environment, when it goes into the field, um, and the same for human safety. So those are absolutely regulatory questions they are always asked and you always have to address those excellent thank you i've got a question here now this is a little bit about fall army whim and, and it's so it's, it's sort of not so specific in biopesticides but i've noticed that the rate of plants of recent damage is high compared with the number of plants with fall army whim larvae i'm wondering if this ratio may be more informative for predicting the need for an intervention very good question. And, and, and I think that's definitely yeah, is something to look at. Yeah, because what I would see with a lot of biopesticides is um, we tend to think the, the size of the population makes things work less well, whereas actually it's about the rate of population growth that is often a critical factor. And I'm going to go and have a discussion shortly in the next couple of slides about that point. Excellent. Um, here's another question. How to manage at field level the problem of fall armyworm strain? So between the, the, the corn or the maize strain and the rice strain, is the response or could the response be different um, as for chemical synthetical pesticide? Yeah, of course it will be. And I think this is, this is something that, you know, when you're doing a trial, that's, that would be sort of a question that you'd, you'd perhaps ask is you take the same product and you try it against the two different um, strains and see if you're getting a differential effect that's then that's a good question to ask and it's a one to address by doing some good um small scale tr trial work excellent and here's another question from uh, maria from eri do you rely on natural pest population in your field trials or do you artificially introduce to the treatments to test for efficacy yeah that's a good that's a, <laughs> that's always a tricky question um yeah, no, um, my preference is that you <coughs> allow nat natural infestation to come in. But when we're putting, we're doing the experimental work and we don't want things to fail, we're really tempted to add our, our pests and disease in. But the difficulty you then have is you, you have too big a population or you have a population that's growing too fast and not representative of what actually happens in the field. So I prefer to avoid doing that but I fully understand why people may want to do that. And I think if you're in a position that you, you think, I can't afford this trial to fa fail, so how do I manage that? Yes, you can introduce your pest or disease, but I think you need to be very careful about how you do that. So for example, if you introduce your insects, if you introduce them all at once, one time, you've got a very synchronous population. So when you test against that synchronous population, is that representative of what would happen in the field? So, or do you need to have multiple releases to have a much more um, mixed population to really understand what happens in the field. And the same with the disease, what I can sometimes see is you, it's really easy to get too much disease. Um, and then you, then you have a problem. So what I try and do is I try and have 
um, a crop that's as, as, as good. And again, if we, if we go for a crop that's too susceptible, what happens is your disease then, then grows much faster than it would in, in, in under um, grower farmer conditions. And so you, you're giving your product too strong a test. So there isn't a clear answer to that, but I think it is something that, again, you need to really think about if, if you have to do that, think about how you're doing it and why you're doing it and how does what you're doing represent what would happen in the farmer's field. Excellent. Thanks, Roma. And just one more question, then we'll move on. Um, th this comes up quite a lot uh, around which microorganism is an effective one against fall armyworm? That's, um, that's the question we're all trying to answer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that, that's what we need to do trials for. And that's part of the reason why we're running this seminar is so that everybody listening to this can go away and answer that question. Excellent. And I think that should lead on to our next part of the session, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. So um, I will close the questions for now and we'll come back to them uh, later, everyone. Okay. So um, what we've talked about so far is the context and what is efficacy. And hopefully what I've, I've sort of, um, you can get from our discussions is, is that it's not such a simple question when we ask what efficacy is. It, it's actually quite a complicated question. And when we're looking at designing trials and looking at running trials, we need to think that through quite carefully before we start to actually go and do the trial. So what I'm going to now look at this and say, well, what does the data look like? So what I'm going to share with you, I'm not going to share with you specific results from specific products I've worked on because um, most of what I'm, work I'm doing is confidential, but what I'm sharing with you is what I've seen in the data. Um, and hopefully um, this will help you to understand some of the things you might be seeing in the data um, or help you to understand things that you might need to sort of be thinking about. <clears throat> so um, the question I'm asking is, you know, why do trials, and I put sometimes fail, but with some technologies, why do lots of my trials fail? Is, and I, I, I just was looking at all my trials and thought, what on earth is going on? And I was just thinking, what's actually happening when I'm running these trials? Why am I getting trials that fail? So here we go. Um, this is a set of data. It's for the same product. It's tested in five trials. Um, and what I tested was we had an untreated, we had a chemical standard, we had three rates of the test um, product, in this case it was a microorganism, and then I also had the standard and the test um, product applied together. And this is the data I got acro across the five trials. So what's the first thing we see? The first thing we can see is you know, the difference in the level of disease in the untreated across all the trials. So in terms of thinking about designing trials, about what we're doing, so first thing we've got is we've got the variation that's gonna be due to the disease. Um, and then what we see is, is the chemical standard also responded differently across all the trials. So we're not getting the same thing happening in all the trials. So what we get here is this is my perfect trial, where as I increase my rate, I get less of my disease, exactly what we want. What I can see here is the standard with the test product and the standard are roughly similar. So what that says to me, there isn't a synergistic interaction. There isn't anything, any added benefit by putting the two, applying the two together. But the problem we get is we also get trials that look like this. So as my dose went up, my population increased and then decreased. So in fact, my lowest rate gave me the best efficacy. And if I put error bars on this, you'd see you've got massively long error bars and all the data, you can't see significant differences um, between your untreated and your treated. So what you then have to do is say, well, I can't in any, each individual trial is valid. I can't see in any individual trial that I have got a significant difference from my untreated. So I then need to combine them together in my mean. And this is what you get when you, with, with the mean. Um, so what this then tells me, I made a comment before that you don't, I never see a consistent dose response curve. And this is part of the evidence why I can make that statement is here we've got a doubling of the, of the um, amount of active substance or amount of product, and we're not seeing a doubling of effect. So I'm not seeing a dose response curve. So what's happening with microorganisms? What I should tell you with this trial set is I did this trial set to see what variation we get. So it was the same contractor with the same equipment on the same crop with the same target applied within two days of each other. And this is the variability again. So we, it wasn't that anybody did anything wrong, 
but this is the natural variability you'll get when you're doing trials with microorganisms and botanicals. And this is our difficulty. And this starts to explain if you have this much variance, why we might have such peculiar results with some of our trials and why it's so hard to see what's actually happening. Then I made a comment and there was a question about the size of the population. So what I wanted to get to the bottom of was people often say to me, biopesticides don't work well when there's lots of a high population. And so what I did is I plotted efficacy against the level of population when I got that efficacy. So I chose one, one test rate and I pl plotted the results for that test rate against what was the population size when I applied that product. And this is what you get, it's pretty much a star chart. It doesn't really show you that the, the size of the population doesn't seem to be the problem. And I did this with three different target insects and I didn't see a correlation between the size of the target population and the efficacy that I got. What I think is happening is it's the rate of population growth which affects efficacy, not the size of the population. And when you have a data set like this, if you're trying to use this data set to, to understand your product, what you could effectively be saying, you know, if I'm looking for 50% efficacy, I've got 50% of my trials that didn't work roughly. Um, and if we wanted to claim 80% efficacy, look at how many trials technically didn't work. And this is what the data really looks like. And this is our challenge is how do we manage this? So when we think about variability, when you're working with a synthesized chemical, you're usually talking about something that's got about 5% variability in how it performs. And that's what's represented on this top gray line. When you're working with a biopesticide, I sort of thought, well, okay, what does my data set tell me? Have I got 20% variability? And if I have 20% variability, that's what this green line, line represents. But actually, I tend to have a little higher than that. It tends to be seeing 40% variability. So that um, sort of scattergram I showed you of efficacy against population size shows how much variability. The trials that I did with a nice consistent set of five trials, it's showing variability. And it's, I, I was thinking, okay, maybe it's sitting around about 40%. But what this means is you can have data points which run from here to here across your trial set and you're saying, well, how do I interpret that? How do I work with that? So what I thought was, um, part of my thinking of this also is, okay, if I'm looking at a dose response curve and I just, I'm just modeling a typical system here. So this is sitting around about my 20% variability. So here's a chemical, 5% variability. So I'll expect a data scatter here. Here's the variability saying at 20%, but I know that I'm probably sitting more like at 40%. So what does this look like? If we look at this closely, what we're seeing here is the better my, I'll oh, maybe go back one a bit, um, sorry. So what I'm seeing here is the better that my product works as efficacy goes up, the wider my data scatter, because that's a function, it's just a numerical function of what happens. And that's absolutely what we see in trial data is that the better it's working, the more variability. Now, of course, when you get to hundred, your, your variance is capped. But if we look here, so when I run trials, my product's working well, I can expect to see efficacy ranging from hundred to 40%. And that's showing me that on average, I'm getting a good level of efficacy. And this is what makes our trials so difficult. So I worked with a statistician to try and understand that. And he said, wow, what's going on is you have your variance due to your crop, you have the variance due to your pest, and because you're dealing with a botanical or microorganism, you have the variance due to that botanical or microorganism as well. And they don't, they're not just additive, they're mul multiplied together. Um, and this is why we get this really, wide data scatter um, and why, why things are, are difficult and don't, don't work. Uh, hopefully that helps you in some sort of thinking about what's going on in the data and then sort of saying, well, if that's what the data is actually going to do, how do I design my trial? How do I work with that? How do I get something sensible out of that? So I have every expectation that I've just triggered a lot of questions, Alison. So is there anything come up? Yeah, we still have a lot of questions left over. Um, so I'm going to start going through them. They they sort of relate to some of this this pre last presentation and, and also before. So I might skip around if that's okay, uh, Roma. Um, yeah. here, here's a comment here. Thank you, Roma, for, for the very interesting talk and, and lots of positive feedback, by the way. So, so you're doing a great job. 
When using a standard chemical as positive control, do you recommend to use a single chemical or a combination of chemicals as regularly used by farmers? That is a combination of cypermethrin and prophenophos. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the question. Okay, yeah, um, you can do both of those. Um, so if, there's, if the standard way in which a farmer manages something is through an IPM program, then you can do that. What you need to think about is, is that st standard um, treatment regime or single treatment, is that going to um, impact uh, or affect or have cross effects on my trials? That's the only thing you need to pay attention to, but you can, you can do either. I mean, it's obviously practically, it's easy if you're just applying one product, um, but um, it's quite legitimate to use an IPM program as your comparison. Okay, uh, another question here. For microbiome biopesticides, uh, such as those toxin producers, uh, can fall armyworm deliver resistance against them or develop, uh, sorry, develop resistance against them if they are used uh, regularly? Okay, so I think the first thing is to say the toxin producers. I think that need to just do a slight correction there. Um, so the microorganisms um, have the potential to produce secondary compounds. Those secondary compounds um, are involved in their pathogenicity towards their host. They may be toxic to the host, but that doesn't mean they're toxic to the environment or to humans. And that's a regulatory question to ask. So I think the assumption that a microorganism has a toxin, I'd say that's not, that's not a valid assumption. I think they produce secondary compounds. And what you have is that there's an intimate mode of action where that, that toxin may be part of the way in which it kills the host. And sorry, Alison, could you just do the and second the, part of the Yeah, question? the second part was whether fall armyworm develops, can develop some resistance against these yeah. products. No, again, I, th I think in terms of, we should always be aware of the management of resistance and we need to think, be thoughtful about that. And we need to think about that as biologists. I think what the evidence is showing is that if you're using products which have multiple modes of action, you're less likely to be driving for resistance development. But what we're all trying to do now is, is to operate IPM programs um, so that you have you in any one program, you always use substances, different substances. So, again, it's managing the managing um, that you're not driving the development of resistance. So I think it'd be naive as, as to say that you'll never get resistance. I think it's a lower likelihood with with a lot of the um, biopesticides, but we should always be wise and practice good IPM to not drive resistance. And we, we need to hold on to the good substances we have as long as possible. Excellent. And is it possible to mix between conventional pesticides and then biopesticides, for example, in a, in a regime to talking about resistance yes. management? Yeah, is that, that, that an option? That, that, that's, yeah, that's what you should be doing is, is you should be looking at saying, what, what does this product do? How do I use that well within an IBM? IPM program and when do I use it in an IPM program and what am I trying to, to achieve and you're balancing that also against the advantages and disadvantages of any of these interventions so that you're causing as little harm to your workers your operators and to the field environment as well as managing pest and disease so that's that's a good question to ask and to always ask yourself how you how do you design a good IPM program. Okay, another question here. Is there any standard biopesticides application protocol with regards to fall armyworm control? And is there a way to reduce the decomposition rate of biopesticides on the field to help control um, or I guess replicate the laboratory tests? Yep, okay. Uh, more? So um, no, there's not a set protocol. Um, there are protocols available and that's sort of again you know lovely introduction that's what we're going to try and talk about in the next session is what could a protocol look like um, there's organizations such as the the epo which which produce um, guidance documents and how to do efficacy trials well and they provide a lot of guidance for, for setting the, the frame, framework um, and then alison sorry the last part uh, no, actually, that's probably a good segue, I think, into the next okay. next section, uh, Roma. So why don't we start there? We've, we've still got lots of questions, um, so we'll still come back to those, um, and yep. I'm sure we'll collect a few more on the way. Okay. All right. So then 
what I've covered in the last part is, is just sort of hopefully starting to understand why the trials don't work and, and why we get failures. Um, so we know that the variance is really high um, and it affects our, our predictability in our trials. We've I've also sort of hopefully demonstrated that um, dose finding is not simple and it's really hard to understand what the dose response curve and perhaps for some microorganisms there isn't a dose response curve or we haven't got enough research money to find out what the dose response curve is. Um, you also, it's been raised about a reference treatment. Um, what, what is your reference treatment and what, what's it's available? So for me, a reference treatment in a trial, I only use it because that tells me, did my trial design work? I'm not actually asking the question is how does my product compare to the reference treatment? I'm only using the reference treatment, the standard treatment to say, did my trial design work? Um, and that's one of the things that I find a little bit frustrating sometimes is people say, oh, it didn't do as well as the, um, the reference. Because what you're trying, that wasn't the question I asked in the trial when I did it. Um, because I'm trying to find alternative products, I'm trying to find new technology that I can use so that we can have a good IPM program. Um, and I also hope, hopefully it's, I've sort of made it clear that the laboratory to the field transfer, it, it can be very poor and to not really, not to spend time in the laboratory testing something, but get out in the field as soon as you can so you can test the effect of the product um, on the whole plant. And then this was raised in that last question as well, to some extent, is, is, is how long does the biopesticide persist? How, how, how long will it be on there? And I think, so there's a tendency to think that we can do stuff to make them last longer, but maybe we can't. And what we have to do is we understand that this is you know, a, a, a baculovirus, it's very susceptible to UV, it's not gonna hang around long. So when I apply it, I need to make sure that I hit the population as well as possible for that one application, rather than spending time thinking, how do I make it last longer? Now, of course, th th there's, th there's a middle ground between those two concepts, but I just encourage people to, instead of trying to make biopesticides be chemistry, why don't we try and understand what biopesticides are, what the advantages they have, and how do we work with them to get the best out of them, rather than trying to make them into chemicals. Um, and again, we should be thinking about applications that are not necessarily just a single application, but they say if you have 30% three times, you're getting your 90% effect. The question then is how do we make that effective? Um, we need to think about application methods such as water volume. And we also have to think that when we're doing some trials, if you're doing with SEMA chemical and it's not approved, you in theory have crop destruct. There's no way as you can afford to do that. So how do we manage that? So all this understanding about what biopesticides can do, understanding about what plants do, understanding about what insects do, we have to bring all those elements together and design our trials. But it does explain why it's so hard to do trials with biopesticides. So one of the things I think you need to start to, to really think about is what's the product? So what's the formulation? What's its specification? Do I really understand the mode of action? What it does? Is it contact acting? Is it systemic? Unlikely to be systemic, most likely to be contact acting. How long it will persist? What's my target crop, etc.? So, you know, for persistence, we need to know that because how often should I reapply? Do I need to reapply every day? Do I need to reapply every seven days? Do I need to reapply once a month? And how do I get that? interaction between persistence and what the insect population is doing or the disease population. How fast is my disease growth? How fast is my insect growth? So what I tend to think is if I know I'm in a period of rapid uh, population growth, I reduce my spray interval. But when I know that the population's not growing so rapidly, I, uh, you can open out your spray interval. But when you're designing a trial, you need to kind of ask yourself these questions and then think, okay, how do I design the trial and answer these questions well? And then I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about how we deliver the product into the crop. Because biopesticides are really amenable to going into existing spare application equipment, we tend not to really, we sometimes don't think really well what we're actually doing and what happens when we put them in the spray application equipment. So for example, a really simple idea is if you've got a recirculation pump, does your, the temperature in your tank increase from the beginning to the end of your delivery? Because if it does, there's a good chance you might kill your microorganism. So actually you spend a lot of time spraying out something that's now dead. So you need to understand the spray tank, you need to understand the um, nozzles, you need to understand your pressures, you need to understand your water volume. And I said it'll be towards the beginning of this presentation, but what biopesticides do is they pick up if you're doing things badly. 
They're really good at finding out you've not done something really well. The other thing you need to think about is droplet size. So if we're thinking about some of the botanicals which are terpene based and are exceedingly volatile, if you have lots of really tiny droplets, those have volatilized before they've had, an, had the chance to have an effect on your target. So you need to think, well, maybe for, for some of these botanicals, I need a, a slightly larger droplet size. And someone raised the question earlier about phytotoxicity. So again, you need to understand what sort of droplet size, what concentration should I have so that I avoid the potential for phytotoxicity. So you need to really think about what's my spray doing, what's it's delivering, what's its droplet size. And you need to really calibrate it well. And then the other part is, is the, always the hard part with application, is which part of the plant needs to be treated? Because we often know that sometimes the insects are hiding somewhere. So how do we get our spray into there? Um, and we need to think of, therefore about the equipment we're using to make sure it, we are delivering it to where we think we're delivering it and where we know we need to deliver it. But just looking at this slightly complicated graph, but hopefully I can explain it. Okay, so what we all know from, this is from conventional chem chemicals, that as droplet diameter here increases, eff efficacy decreases. What we're trying to do is we find a nice balance between droplet size in the middle here and the effect, the efficacy that we're having. And we're looking when we design our droplet size, water volume, et cetera, is to be in this spot here. So we need to be really thoughtful about how we do that. And we do that by thinking about our nozzles, the pressures and our water volumes. The other thing we talk about is we talk at the beginning is what is efficacy um, and how do we assess efficacy? So we tend to think I'm gonna be counting dead and live insects. And then somebody very wisely from the audience raised, well, what about repellency? How do we measure repellency? Um, so this is when we're thinking about a trial design. Do we just need to count live and dead insects or do, do I need to just find out how much disease incidence and severity I have? Um, how do I measure these? Um, so these are good starting points, but they're not the end point. We also need to think about what's happened to the plant. Do I have I got a healthy plant? So sometimes what I can see when I've done work with say on cereal plants is my green leaf area is atrocious. I've got really rubbish green leaf area. And you look at the disease and think, well, I haven't done anything to disease, but lo and behold, I get a better yield with my biopesticide and a better quality than I did with my chemical. But when I take the standard measures of looking at how it worked, it, that, that isn't apparent. So this is why you, some, you need to think about what's my plant health look like? What are my changes in green leaf area? And particularly to think about what's the yield and what's the quality? Because what the farmer's interested in is can I grow a crop to get a good yield of good quality? And can I improve the marketability of my crop? So when we think about trial design and think about how we're assessing efficacy, don't just be limited to counting dead and alive insects or areas of disease. And for repellency, um, this is the really tricky one because actually if you're trying to count your insects and you've got repellency, your insects have all disappeared. So if you're counting let, dead, let, dead insects, you're not gonna assess that with repellency. So for repellency, you have to think about something else that you're, you're, you're assessing. Um, so thinking about the trial design, which we'll, I'll go into detail in our next session is what we need to think about. We're not, we should be thinking of this as population biologists. We are trying to use these biopesticides for population management. That's what IPM is doing, it's population management. We're trying to reduce the population below a damage threshold so the farmer can get a good quality crop. So to do this, we need to understand the bio, biological characteristics of the product, the relationship between dose and effect, and the modes of action. And something I try and do in, trial, in trials is we as scientists, we're trained to do this, we look for the best. But actually, a farmer doesn't really care the best. He doesn't care about that one trial where you hit 90%. What he wants to know is, if I use this product, when doesn't it work? And I find this kind of thinking is quite useful. So what I mean by this is, the farmer, it's really useful if the label and the farmer knows that if your humidity drops below this level, the product won't work. Or if your population is at this rate of growth, the product won't work or if you miss the timing of the application, your product won't work. So maybe when you design trials, what should we are finding out is when things don't work, whereas what we tend to do is we try and find out when things work best, but actually a farmer needs to know when it doesn't work, and then you can give them really good advice about how to use the product. And think about 
what what is it if it's not working what is the effect that i need to have how often do i need to put in so for example if i put the product out at a 10 day interval it maybe not work but it works when I put it out at a seven day interval. And that's useful for the farmer to know. He can then use that and he can design his IPM program with that information. But often in, when we do efficacy trials, we forgot, we forget to answer those questions because we're so interested in saying, how do I make, get the best out of it? How do I hit my 80%? How do I hit my 100%? So think about water volumes, think about the techniques and equipment. So I'm beginning to sum up now. So I asked the question is why do biopesticides sometimes fail? And hopefully I've provided some information that, and some thoughts around that to help you understand why, we, why you can often have so many failures. Um, and hopefully you understand that this is because this isn't about chemistry, it's about biology. We're working with biological systems. So the biological system of the product, the biological system of the plant and the biological system of the pest and disease. And then what we're going to talk about in our next session is, is how do we design a trial for a biopesticide? How do we make that work well? So I was going to pause um, here um, and ask any questions, Alison. Um, and that's the end of my presentation, more or less then. Thank you so much, Roma. Uh, that was absolutely excellent. Lots of questions, lots of really useful tips and, and pointers there. And when Roma refers to that next session, um, that is in April. Uh, so that's going to be another great session for people to, to come to. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from this session um, that people will have to ask at the next session in April. Uh, lots of questions. So this this is the end. And we've got, we've got time now to ask Roma um, quite a few questions then we'll have a summary from um, Rika and then we'll uh, conclude uh, and then we will stay on for an informal chat afterwards uh, to answer any other us answer any other questions that you might have. Um, here is a question here um, in a publication um, Isman Murray said that a lot of publications were not useful because of the few details given. What would be your recommendation about publication of results? Yeah, um, I think when you publish the results, I think what really helps is if it's got a good consideration of what the questions you were asking, what was the information you wanted to have from the trial? And then you, the trial is designed to gather information about those questions you asked. Um, and then that data is, um, shared and now if you put the raw data in a paper it's not accepted so I think it's really important to have um, good good trial design to have the data summarized well to know the variance it's really important to have the variance explained well and I think then a good discussion which understands what was happening with the pest what was happening with the plant and what was happening with the product to understand all those elements um, but I think it's really important that you share information on the variants and the what you really saw in the data and what we often do and we all do it is if a trial didn't work we don't include it but actually when a trial doesn't work it tells us really useful information and I think if we were we put those into publications of actually I did 10 trials and only two of them worked and these are why eight of them didn't work this is what I think I think that's really good shared information that we can share amongst ourselves and then we start to understand what's really happening. And that's a good point, Roma. I'd like to see that too. <laughs> Not sure that's going to happen soon, but let's hope so, because um, I think that would be very useful. I think we learn a lot from those failures um, just as much from the successes. Here's a question here. Would spraying to drip point to improve coverage also help improve efficacy? Absolutely not. <laughs> so that's one of my bugbears. Really frustrates me. People say spray to runoff. Spray to runoff means you're spending a lot of money to spray it on the ground. Absolutely the wrong policy. Um, you need to have the right droplet size and good coverage. But just to, to lay out here, a project I work on in the UK, uh, the team looking at application of biopesticides um, in greenhouse crops, so tomatoes and cucumbers, um, so nice tall crops. And what they found is if they change the water volume from a thousand litres to hectare, to 500 litres per hectare, they got a 37% increase in efficacy. Mm. Okay. So spraying to runoff is just an absolute waste of time. That is not how you get good coverage. You need to think about your droplet size and where you place it in the crop. 
if you go to, towards runoff or even just before runoff, you're actually spending a lot of money bouncing the product onto the ground and it doesn't get to your target. Okay, great answer. Uh, here's another question. Is there any biopesticide for plant viruses, for example, cotton blue disease, or just to th just think to the insect vectors? Yeah, the, the answer to their own question. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you, you, it's the vector that you need to um, manage. Yeah. Excellent. Good answer. Right. And then I, I'm just moving down and moving up here. I've got lots of questions. Actually, I'll just go back to, because you, you've sort of you've gone through this, but I just wanted to sort of re-emphasize that point around uh, at the moment, the data we collect to observe is on leaf damage and then yield. And are there other parameters we can collect to observe, for example, those other types of interactions or plant health measures? I guess I'm just re-emphasizing your presentation here. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So th th and that, that's my point. So um, depending on the crop, um, it's, it's, it's quality is a good one. Um, marketability. So when you, if you take the um, trial to, to yield and then make an assessment of what, what's marketability, because you, depending on the biopesticides, you can sometimes see. So what I sometimes see with, say, potatoes, is that you your yield isn't any higher, but what you have is you have a more uniform um, size of your potatoes, which yeah. the market likes better. Um, yeah, so, that's a good point. Yes, so it's, it's, it's looking for that marketability and, and, and how you might have changed that. Yeah, excellent. No, that, that's a very good point, and it's probably missed sometimes. I think I'm thinking about that. Just, here's a question: How much do these? How much do trials cost? I mean, is this something that's a, it costs a huge amount of money? I mean, do some of these? Some of our researchers out there have to spend a lot or need a lot of resources to do these. How can you make them more cost effective? Yeah, and I think one of the ways to make them more cost effective is we can reduce the failures so you don't have to run so many. Um, and I think, you know, a well thought out design does also have to manage costs. Um, yeah, it, it, the cost of running efficacy trials is a barrier. Um, and, it, well, not a barrier, it, 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 they can be expensive. I mean, I know what they cost in Europe, but that's not going to really necessarily help help this audience. So I know if I run a, G, a GP trial, um, in Europe um, on say strawberries or tomatoes or, or anything, it's around about 8,000 euros per trial. And that would be for a five treatment trial with, with um, four to six applications and a full assessment through. So it, it can be expensive, but I, so that's why I sort of said, think about mini plots and think about what questions you can answer by working mini plots to save your costs. And then when you move to the field trial in a way, you sort of already know what your answer should be and then and you design the trial so that it doesn't fail um but yeah they do cost a lot and that's why i've done so many trials is because i'm it's commercial companies paying for to run these trials yep okay excellent um and but i think that's a good a good hint around um the mini plots as well so so i hope people have heard that um there's another question here around uh I guess it's a safety one and I'm just trying to find it. It's really about, oh, there's one around the residual maximum limit of bo botanical pesticides. Mm -hmm. um, yep. What What are the sort of rules or things to know about okay. that? I mean, I so guess this, that this applies is, just like any application yep. of... So this is a registration. During registration of a botanical, the same as the registration of anything else, you have to think about are there any on-crop residues? Yeah. Um, and to have a residue, you need to have two factors. You need to have um, toxicity and exposure. If one of those is missing, then you don't have a residue. Now, with, with say, with botanicals in particular, um, mo many, so in some cases, particularly the terpenes, these are terpenes that are, that are found in plants anyway. So if you went to try and find a residue, you wouldn't be able to detect it because it's, you're putting on something that's already in many plants. So if you think about something like limonene, limonene is already in plants. But this is a question that is asked in regulation. Um, most times you're able to address it um, with partial reason case and partial studies. And as far as I'm aware, most of the botanicals don't have residues. That's not to say all of them don't, but most of them don't have, have residues because you often either don't have toxicity or you don't have exposure. Okay. Excellent. Here's another question here. How how can you make the application of biopesticides cost effective in terms of types of formulations or use of sprayers 
are there some tips around how you can make them more cost effective? Yeah, so okay. Um tips tips well one I gave one tip about sprayers is don't work high water volumes and put it all on the ground. <clears throat> so yes, you you can you can design your um think about your spray application tank, you can think about your water volume, think about your nozzle, your droplet size, and calibrate that well so that you're delivering the product onto the plant where you want it, and that starts to save you some money. Can you improve its efficacy by form formulation? Unlikely. I think formulation can improve its persistence potentially, or can improve the rate at which it works, but it won't necessarily uplift your efficacy. But formulation, I think, is work that should be done commercially in-house for the companies who really are developing the products. Um, so I think this is where we have to make this change and think as biologists, and it is just complicated and it is just difficult. Um, and to make it cost effective, what we need to do is to make sure that when we put something out there, it's going where we want it at the right time. And that's and okay. not just trying to kill everything in sight, but just get things below a damage threshold and really operate IPM practices. Okay, excellent answer. Um, I've got, um, I, I think you're gonna be able to answer this. I think this, because I think this question is going to be discussed in the next session, but around, um, is there any specific experiment plot design you can advise on? Is that something that you're gonna answer in the next session? Yes. Exactly. Excellent. So we can leave that one there. And I do have another question that I'm going to answer here from Robert around how can int anyone interested in running trials um, using products, uh, for example, against full armyworm, if you're interested in working with the ASEAN Action Plan and do running pilots, etc., we're very keen to hear from you. Um, so you can contact us uh, and we can follow up uh, for that question. So if you're interested in pilots uh, working together around biocontrol and the biocontrol program across Southeast Asia, please contact, contact us um, and you have our email, I think, from the, um, from the registration uh, at FAW at growasia.org. So thank you for that. And uh, Roma, that actually draws us to a close. Um, Thank you so much. I, I can tell you that we have lots of questions, but we also um, have so much positive feedback uh, from all the audience uh, about your presentation and, and absolutely superb. So thank you for sharing with us your knowledge today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for asking me to take part. Yeah, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that you can conserve your voice after having such a star role today. <laughs> you may need a rest for the rest of the day. I'm just going to ask um, uh, Rika Joy Floor from URI, and we may just have to uh, find her uh, Pranav. Um, I'll just see if I can find her too. Um, yeah, she's unmuted. She has the oh, power excellent. to unmute herself at least. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Alison. And um, shall I proceed now? Yes, you're most yeah, welcome. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, Roma, for that fantastic presentation. It was so rich. And I knew I wanted to join this trial for our own experiments. And that's really what I got. Um, it is also a lot of interesting discussions through the questions. And uh, that made us uh, that made the session even uh, richer. And so it makes uh, my job to summarize this uh, a lot harder. But allow me to <laughs> just present a few takeaway points um, for me, what was really great about this presentation was you've given us a framework to think about how we can proceed uh, planning and, and designing the trials uh, upcoming uh, without going so deep into the methodology, just thinking about, okay, what are the products? Well, how does it work? What does it do? Um, how does it interact uh, in terms of dose and, and the effect, uh, the dose response? Um, how does it work in an IPM context? Um, how can we uh, further um, look at that in terms of damage thresholds um, and later on translate that into costs uh, application um, uh, splits and, and cost effectiveness for, for the farmers? How do we apply it well um, in terms of timing, in terms of, of uh, the delivery of the product? Um, that was uh, really good, I think, um, uh, in terms of moving forward uh, from a broader perspective uh, at those trials. Uh, the second thing I, I really liked was uh, your explanation at the beginning on the multiple interactions between the product and the plants. And that 
we should not just, uh, when we're assessing efficacy, we have to think beyond the normal things that we usually consider uh, the, the parameters um, looking um, also at bigger, at green leaf area, at, at, at the quality, at marketability. Uh, these are points that really uh, uh, often we forget when we are planning for collecting the data. So that's, that's really um, great to hear. Um, the third point I, I take away from this is um, further angles to look into in terms of the data. Why is there so much variance in my data? Why does it look like this? Um, in terms of how the pest, um, how the, the, the pest biology and, and the ecology, um, the product itself, how, what effect it, it can make and the plant itself, uh, how does it often respond? So these are my takeaway. Um, thank you so much, Roma, for such a rich uh, presentation today. Uh, Alison, over to you. Thank you so much, Rika. Um, perfect summary. Um, it's really nice to hear from, from the audience there, just sort of their takeaways. And, and I think we're, we're taking all that on board and all the questions. I'd like to bring this session to a close. Um, if you could just move the slide, Roma, and I'll just remind people, you've got that biopesticide efficacy part two, effective design of trials on the 8th of April. Uh, on the 18th of March, in two weeks, we're looking at farmer acceptance of biocontrol approaches and scale up issues. So there's lots still uh, of really Really rich discussion to come. Before we go today, I'd just like you to answer uh, one more poll just to see if you're still there uh, and listening, all 174 of you now, which is a massive number of people. It's really how useful did you find this webinar? Um, at, we're not taking your name, so please uh, please feel free to answer uh, truthfully, but I'm sure it's going to be a very good response there. So please fill that out as you go, and um, that draws uh, a close. So I'd like to thank everyone that has uh, helped out today, Pranav uh, in the background there, answering lots of people's questions as well. Roma, perfect presentation, really, really informative, and it's a privilege to have you on board. Rika, thank you for, for bringing this summary um, to an end. Um, it's really nice to have that perspective. And I'd like to thank you all to the participants. It's really, really great to have so many people, over 200 have joined us today. Uh, and loads of questions and it just goes to show the interest out there uh, and and uh, the passion around um, biocontrol and finding solutions to control fall armyworm. So thank you very much. And uh, once you've done the survey, if you would like to um, leave, you're most welcome. And those who would like to stay, um, we, we'll, we'll just stay for a little while longer and have a very informal question and answer time. Um, and you can also put your hand up if you want to ask something to Roma. Uh, and we could probably unmute you. I see someone's hand up. <laughs> Go, Roma, if you'd like to speak. No, I was, my hand wasn't up. <clears throat> oh, excellent. Okay. I'll just um, see. Can you see who? Oh, no, they've put their hand down. So we've got lots of questions, and I'm just going to, we've, we've got actually 51 questions. They're not all questions, but um, maybe just to ask you here, um, can Roma talk a little bit more on her experience on organic cotton? And what was her conclusion after visiting the experiments or field visits? Yeah, happy to. Um, so uh, in that case, in Benin, they don't have, and that was a, this, what the project I was on was, was for FAO. I was looking at what was available um, in terms of biopesticides, but they really only had neem available. So what most of the farmers were doing there was actually doing a lot of monitoring, a lot of um, <clears throat> hand checking, um, and then using neem strategically. So they were in a difficult position where they didn't have enough biopesticides available to um, support them. And that was the point of my visit was to sort of identify what else they might need. So I can't really share any richer experience beyond the fact they needed more products. Okay, excellent. No, that's good. Uh, here's another one. What is the advised relative humidity and temperature for the efficiency of applying biopesticide? So this is probably applying, um, well, I was going to say applies more to microorganisms, but also botanicals, yeah. Um, so what you should be able to see is that for certain types of biopesticides, you might um, see an extra advisory um, comments on the label, which sort of say, um, 
apply when conditions are <clears throat> it's going to be humid so for example apply in the evening um, because as you expect they're microorganisms so if you apply it in the midday sun it's um, the droplets will dry very quickly um, and that you may have UV damage to the to the microorganisms so what tends to happen is the manufacturers know this and they mark that on the labels um, and the advice is to pay close attention to that and you often see apply first thing in the morning or apply at night and that's about managing UV exposure less a little bit about temperature but then about humidity and again another way to manage that is to think about your droplet size and to think about what you're trying to do there. So you may actually want a droplet which has a lot more, a little bit more water around it so that you keep the um, humidity up in the, in the, around the biopesticide. <laughs> Good answer there. And, and, and here's one that I think is going to sort of similar, and I think it will really depend on the context, um, to be honest, and of course the biopesticide that you use, but it's which instar larvae of fall armyworm and how many larvae per square metre should we apply biopesticides on the field to get the highest efficiency? Well, second part, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody needs to do an experiment about that. The first part, um, <clears throat> it's not... Uh, in common with, I think, um, what we know about other uh, bi biopesticides against other lepidopterans, the younger instars, the early life stages are usually the more susceptible ones. Okay, excellent. Um, and I'm running through the questions here. Uh, he here, in case of biopesticides, how does preventative application on the target crop affect target insect pests before or to save expected plant damage? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> because you're dealing, the, because you're dealing with something that's non-persistent, non-systemic, you really are looking to apply it when the pest or disease is present. But what we do know is that, as observers, and when we start to look at the crop, we often underestimate whether the pest or disease is already present at the time. So, you're never going to go really early. You're going to be coinciding your application with what you understand from your observations of your pest and disease. And you're going to be looking at trying to put your first applications on when your population is really low. Um, so that what the idea in the IPM is that you just keep, always keep your population low. You're not waiting till it goes really high before you try and manage it. Um, but you can't sort of apply a month before and expect it still to be working a month later when the pest turns up. So you, you have to understand your insect or disease and when it arrives in the field. Okay. Um that's a, that's a really important message, I think, and that's came, come up quite a few times through this session. So um, very good. And, and here's one here around how about the time of application for biopesticides when comparing protected cultivation to open field for fall armyworm management? Yeah, that's kind of interesting because when as biopesticides were first developed, they were developed in, for protected cropping. Um, and there tends to come from that belief that that's because they only work best in, in protected cropping. And that's not entirely true. The reason that they were developed in those market first was because they were high value markets. Um, and what you can often see is that when you're able to use a biopesticide in a good IPM program across a wider area, you create a more complex and stable um, cropping system and you actually see the biopesticides working really well in that situation. If we think about semi chemicals, they're going to work better on a large scale than a small scale. So I don't see a difference, uh, in necessarily see a difference in efficacy of something between a protected and a field situation. It's again more about applying it at the right time in the right way um, for the population. Yeah. Excellent. And, and I guess uh, here's another question that you're going to say it's going to depend and, and you have to find it out. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you anyway, because it's nice to share what people are doing. Um, I evaluated certain botanical e extracts as like hot pepper and garlic on trichogramma mm -hmm. parasitoids in the laboratory because I need to try it with the trichogramma parasitoids release and BT on the fall armyworm. I ask if this would be effective. Uh, so okay I don't quite understand what they did no I'm not quite sure as well but I think they're using botanical extracts as uh, hot pepper and garlic and mm. then they have trichogramma parasitoids in the laboratory 
And then yeah, they want, I think what they want, to, then they have a trichogram of parastoids release and BT on the full army worm. I guess maybe they're trying a few different approaches there. Yeah, I think I think this maybe raises a question that um, if you're working with some of these botanicals um, that that have insecticidal activity, you need to check that you're not killing your natural enemies. Yep. Um, and if you are killing your natural enemies, then you think about the timing of application so that you're not um, causing problems to the natural enemies. So, for example, you may apply them at a time of day when you know the natural enemy is not on the crop. Okay, that's a good question. So that's something to keep in mind, I guess, is that if you're looking at um, botani using botanicals um, in Southeast Asia, it's making sure that it doesn't have any impact on the friendly insects, I guess, yeah. Rana. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, and I'm just moving up. I've got a few. Here's a question from Keith um, Jones. It says, your, your dose response curve shows that the slope for microorganisms is generally much longer lower than that of a chemical is not part of the explanation the lack of difference between doses in your earlier graph where i think you said there was two times between each dose yeah no uh, keith no it's not as simple as that um that's what so first off i mean i've never seen a consistent dose response curve um and that's to do with spatial arrangement of the microorganism in the crop is one of the reasons for that. And it's a, the crop architecture is very complex. So how much um, microorganism you've got out per unit leaf area is complicated. So um, it's not simply explained by that, I'm afraid. Um, if someone wants to do a PhD on why you don't get a dose response curve for microorganisms, I think there's a very nice PhD in there. Um, <laughs> You need to be a mathematician and a, a physicist, I think, to understand it. Excellent. Here, here's a question here. Um, the residue of biopesticide, can it be detected in the plant? And then can it uh, be harmful to man and animal, etc.? I think we sort of talked about this before, actually, but it would be good just to... to... Yep, so just to reiterate, so um, when you register a, 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 a biopesticide, that's a regulatory question you want to ask. Now, so for most of the microorganisms, the way that that's uh, responded, most applicants are able to make a reasoned case, which is able to demonstrate the rate at which the biopesticide is used is similar to um, what you would find in the natural background level. And then I said for residues, you need toxicity and exposure. So one, by exposure, you're um, only applying something at levels that you might find at the background level. And what you're doing is you're applying to the right time to manage the pest. And then the second part is, is toxicity. Um, you know, if you've got something like a BT or you've got so, something like um, uh, a virus, they're specific to insects. They don't, they're not pathogenic to humans. They'll do nothing. So there's no toxicity or pathogenicity to humans. So you can't have a residue because you don't have toxicity. Okay. So um, Roma, I, I think I'm going to release you back into the wild zone because I think you need a rest for your voice before we completely <laughs> run it dry and you can't talk to anyone else ever again. Um, but before you go, I've got a, just a question here around that, that regulatory uh, um, sort of environment, I guess. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I often hear that it's too hard to to register some of these products or oh, it's very difficult and it, it takes many years. I mean, is it always like that? Are there, are there tricks? I mean, I don't expect you to give me all the tricks now, but can, can, can that, is there hope there to, to actually? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. There is. Um, so something that um, FAO um, and WHO produced a few years ago was a guideline for the registration of microbials, botanicals and senior chemicals. That was designed to help um, companies who, oh, sorry, countries who want to have biopesticides to help them to adapt their regulatory systems for biopesticides. And it gives a really good explanation of how you can do that. And for much of the development of the dossiers, um, you're providing good information about the biology. So it doesn't, biopesticide registration does not need to take a long time. There's lots of really good guidance out there. I think one of the difficulties we have is that the regulators, um, most regulatory organizations have a body of people who are trained in chemistry and to deal with biopesticides, you need people who are trained as microbiologists as well, um, because it's very, a chemist can't assess the microbial very well. Um, 
and we can see that there's programs of work to help with capacity building, to exchange knowledge um, and to support regulators. So there's no reason specifically that biopesticide registration should take a long time. Um, and often what I find as an example, if I prepare a dossier for a biopesticide, I'm probably looking at paper, two, two meters worth of paper stacked high to high. If you're submitting a dossier for a chemical, you're probably looking at about 20 or 30 meters of paper. So the amount of information that needs to be assessed is much smaller because you don't trigger toxicity, so you're not needing to do higher testing. So in theory, it should actually go faster. Okay. Oh, well, that's actually, that's nice to leave on a positive note. And <laughs> I think that's actually a really good message. And actually somebody's asked for those guidelines and I've taken your name down, Robert. So I will actually send you a link to the registration guidelines afterwards. But I think if you do a search uh, FAO guidelines on regulations around biopesticides, potentially, that might just pop up. Uh, and there's, there's information about efficacy in there as well and links to, you know, useful documents. Great. And I can put that in an email for people. So I'm going to actually close the questions now, but we will look at the questions that are still there. I will actually send them to Roma and um, I will try and answer, get some of those answered as well. Uh, and we will try and share that with you and um, be in contact with a copy of the slides and the presentation. And thank you for staying. There's actually 130 people stayed for this wow. last 15 minutes so thank you so much uh, everyone it's been a really delight to to have this session and all the sessions so far have been really really very interesting so thank you Roma um, and good mm -hmm. luck have a rest have a nice cup of tea or something there in in the UK and um, yes uh, take care take care everyone thank bye you,